Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of GPN 20. Um, I will uh, start presenting our speaker today in English because the talk is in English as well. Um, welcome to Dysphoric Unicorn. She's a professional web developer and will share with us insights on um, bad UI design choices people make to make it almost impossible to um, reject consent to cookies or to find certain options to cancel subscriptions and so on. She's doing um, web development professionally and gets annoyed uh, with bad design uh, when she sees it and wants to yeah, educate us on how these things work, what can be done about it, and what we can learn from it. Uh, please welcome this for a unicorn and enjoy the talk. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, come to the dark side. They have cookies, uh, a wonderful original joke that I personally came up with that is no one has ever made before. Uh, well, um, yeah, standing here on this big stage, I almost want to walk around, but I'm not going to cause any more problems for the walk, so <laughs> I'll just stay here. Um, so generally, uh, as a quick um, like thing I want to mention is, it's not, uh, uh, the word dark patterns isn't actually that uh, used that commonly anymore. Um, the industry standard is now deceptive design patterns. That wonderful joke wouldn't have worked with deceptive design, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's because like associating darkness with bad uh, comes from white supremacy, so people no longer want to use the word dark pattern. Um, I will try not to use it. I changed all slides except this one. I don't think that deceptive design is the perfect word because it's not just about deception. It's also about just general user hostility. So I switch between the words deceptive design and user hostile design basically to mean the same things. Okay, then let's get started. A bit about me. Yeah, I'm a web developer and I kind of specialized in uh, UX and accessibility stuff. So um, after learning all these rules, how to do things correctly, I've got an eye for when things are done incorrectly, obviously, and I get annoyed by that. And well, yeah, I've also implemented user hostile design before at my first job. I'm not proud of it. Uh, I tried to complain, but I was just a junior dev and um, I didn't have much of a say in that matter. And also, I made that joke yesterday already, but you remember those uh, Japanese eels that forgot what people looked like, so uh, people were asked to video chat them so they remember what people are during the pandemic. That's basically me, so um, sorry if I speak a bit too quickly or something like that. Um, yeah. What is deceptive design? Uh, deceptive dot design, a website by the person who actually coined the, the word. Um, they define it as deceptive design patterns, also known as dark patterns, are tricks used in websites and apps that make you do things you didn't mean to, like buying or signing up for something. I've got a bit of a different definition, although those are definitely compatible. There are patterns and de uh, design choices that are intentionally inaccessible and misleading to further the cause of capitalist profit maximization. And they are evil. And they are everywhere. <laughs> um, but most likely the first, first thing where you've noticed them is these wonderful consent banners, which are apparently uh, required by law in the EU and, um, well, actually they're not, unless you do things that people probably don't want you to. So none of the websites I work on have one of these banners, even though we use cookies. Um, if you don't track people, uh, you don't need their consent to leave cookies that like store their language prefer preferences and stuff like that. This is not legal advice, consult a lawyer, and, uh, but yeah, generally you don't need them if you don't do things that users probably don't want to. And most implementations are illegal because they don't conform to GDPR. Um, I've also checked out a list of the 50 most popular cookie consent libraries so that you can just stick onto your website. 
And as at time of writing, there were three libraries in, th in this list of 50 that did not employ any dark patterns uh, or deceptive design uh, and were fully compliant with, G with GDPR. So that's a bit telling, uh, but enough of that. Let's talk about some methods, obviously not to replicate, but to see them and to, to know them when they're in front of you. Um, first of all, the most, most common one is the reject option styling and position. So you've got this reject button that either looks like it's disabled or doesn't look interactive or looks like regular text, or maybe it says something that is not reject, but manage my choices or something like that. Um, yeah, and it's usually not uh, reachable in one click while except obviously is. Um, here I've got an example that I did not find, but someone else did. That was the unsubscribe link in an email, which was white text on white background. <laughs> That's not used commonly, but I just found I wanted to show it here. <laughs> Misleading language is another thing that's often used. It's difficult to understand, not always in the user preferred language, even if the website is. There's also like sometimes double negatives, abstain from sending me no marketing mails, except underneath specific uh, settings uh, that just resets what the user chose, even though I think that it just accepts their choices. Um, and here I've got an example where they asked me to accept everything. In addition to, I would like to uh, get emails, but I'm pretty sure if I said accept everything, I would have gotten emails. Overwhelming the user, way too many checkboxes. Sometimes like a tiny part of the site is scrollable even though, uh, and has all the checkboxes, even though there's a lot of white space, but the checkboxes are like really constrained. Um, an easy, easily reachable close button that is considered as consent or that does what you want the user to do even though they might not want to do it. I just want to get rid of all these pop-ups so I accept whatever. Um, also these really annoying pop-ups that say, hey, continue in browser or use a very much better app that's just, well, yeah, a browser that opens the website but doesn't show the pop-up <laughs> and tracks you. And also this lock-in with Google on every single sub-page. Maybe you've noticed when you're reading Medium blogs. So um, what better way to showcase overwhelming design than with a slide that is way too crowded? We've got a couple of examples. Like we also have the, so many people are looking at this right now, bye, 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 which is also a bit um, overwhelming and just stressful to the user. Uh, another thing is forced action, like pop-ups that are not possible to close, making users log in or disable ad block, um, making users download an app. Like here we have got the court website, which is all user submitted content, but in order to access it on a mobile device, you have to download the app. It won't let you swipe to see other courts. Um, or only allowing consent revocation through browser settings, uh, where most pages ignore those settings, is also a bit annoying. And yeah, you've probably seen these um, news websites, which are also like, hey, you could pay, or you could agree to ads and tracking. Then there's also unfriendly defaults. Adding a monthly subscription instead of a one-time uh, purchase, you probably know this when you're buying like Sriracha source online or something like that, the default will always be send me one every month. I don't use that much, much Sriracha source, but yeah. Pre-checking the I want spam checkboxes, uh, not legal, but still commonly done. Um, showing reduced prices by default is something I've recently seen. Like there's rebates for people under a certain age or for a specific time frame or just rebates that simply do not exist at all. So you first, think it's cheap, but then it's a lot more expensive. Then there's also abusing the lost cost fallacy. So introducing things the user does not want after they've already completed some work to do what they wanted. Service charges and shipping that are only visible after you've already com basically completed your purchase are one example. Or DRM that only allows using purchased media with certain devices or software. 
which is something I had to deal with because I downloaded some books <laughs> for this event to read on the way, but whatever. There's also the Roach Motel, something where agreeing is easy but revoking is hard or getting into the situation is easy but you can't really get out again. Like, um, you can subscribe via the website but you've got to call or even send a letter or a fax uh, to cancel. Then you've also got these, yeah, maybe not these days, but yeah, text this number for uh, wonderful ringtones which also create a subscription that is difficult to get out of. Subscriptions added to your card without your knowledge. And free trials that also uh, that directly switch to a paid plan, which is also very, very common. Forced wait times. Not taking the option the site provider wants you to take has an added unnecessary delay. So um, let's look at the time because this slide is three minutes long. So if I have to waste some time, I could make you look at it for the entire time. But yeah, it takes three minutes. Two minutes of that are after it's already reached 100%. Um, and this is in a browser without ad block enabled. It just has the default tracking. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I won't force you to look at all this. Um, there's also the rejection of standards. Not supporting industry standards to lock in customers uh, to specific stores like these Tesla superchargers. Most things about Apple, Actually, the reason why I'm presenting this on an iPad instead of a laptop is that um, while the web version of Keynote, which is the software I wanted to use because I like its usability, simply does not allow adding or playing video. You can add GIFs and they will perfectly play inside the edit view, but once you go to present, it won't play the GIFs. <laughs> Wonderful. I only realized after all my free talks were already done. <laughs> Um, yeah, also uh, Kindle devices not supporting EPUB files without conversion and also printer ink, like many printers that won't take cheap ink. Um, another thing, user hostile design is not just in the domain of tech. We've also got supermarkets which are designed pretty hostile, like they've got candy uh, near the checkout, so um, so children will complain to their par parents, I'm bored, buy me this candy, or even more evil like tobacco and alcohol product products that trigger uh, addiction craving if you stare at them too long. Placing in inexpensive products low or high on the shelves and uh, expensive ones where they're easy to reach and where you can easily see them. Escalators that make you walk around this the, these thing before you can go down again. So you hopefully see some great sale that uh, you're gonna make use of or something. And also tiny bagging areas near checkout because once you've paid, once you've done what they wanted you to, you're basically you have to leave as soon as possible so they make the checkout areas really small so you're stressed out, which I absolutely hate. Um, eligible ads like ads that you can't really understand, so you get closer or you spend more time on them. don't have an example right now, but I'm pretty sure uh, you've came across this. Um, and also another thing, probably not everyone will agree with me on this, but uh, car-dependent suburban sprawl is also user-hostile design, in my opinion. Because, like, especially in North America, there are these huge suburbs where you cannot walk or bike anywhere. Um, public transit was destroyed uh, and like you obviously need a car, you need to buy gas uh, and this is very lucrative for the people that sell those things. Yes, who does it hurt the most? Because like I may get annoyed by it but I'm not the one who gets uh, hurt the most. Like first of all disabled people We've got illegible color contrasts that may be difficult for me to see, but impossible to see for someone with color blindness. Phone calls uh, to cancel something are hard or even impossible for many people. So they're gonna need to find someone who helps them cancel that subscription. Um, more physical motion is necessary to un accomplish intended tasks or refuse dat data mining. So. If, if you have trouble using the mouse, um, that may be an issue. 
Text is often not easily understandable, so you don't know what you're agreeing to. And uh, especially like dyslexic people will only be able to skim many pages, so they won't know they've signed a contract that requires a monthly payment because it's usually hidden somewhere. Um, yeah, it also definitely hurts people without much money a lot more. Uh, disagreeing to uh, data collection is very time consuming. Cheap monitors also just handle contrast poorly, so it's basically like you're colorblind. Um, reloads after selecting more options um, will use more bandwidth and data, which uh, is bad if you're on a metered plan. And um, also, they tend to spend then they they tend to re-render the entire page, which means more time spent rendering, especially on low-powered devices. Monthly expenses can become existence-threatening, like a subscription you didn't know you had. I actually had Amazon Prime for a couple of months without realizing it because I thought I had canceled. I didn't realize it because, yeah, money is not that much of an issue for me. <laughs> For other people, this would have been a really big thing. And also, um, especially in places where education is expensive, uh, less education may lead to less knowledge about how to avoid being manipulated. So who is at fault for this? I've got that gift there because I thought it was funny. Actually, I think developers are the ones who are probably at least at fault. <laughs> um, well, capitalism, obviously, because this is all about profit maximization. If we didn't have to maximize profits, if we didn't have to, had to press every single penny out of our users, uh, we wouldn't have this issue. Uh, legislators, GDPR, in my opinion, was a great idea, but the implementation isn't, isn't so good, and it also there isn't enough enforcement of it. like. Recently, Google had had to announce that they would add an easily reachable disagree button because of it, because they were getting some uh, repercussions. But yeah, generally, most most companies tend to ignore or just badly implement what they have to. Uh, also, much of this is not illegal, um, while it definitely should be. Yeah, also developers, uh, open source libraries that contain dark patterns or deceptive design, user hostile design. Um, as I said, like basically every package you can just download and uh, put into your site will include user hostile design. Um, underpaying the harm done is also a thing I've often seen. Like, yeah, it's not such mu so much of a problem. It doesn't matter, whatever. And also not pushing back hard enough when uh, forced to implement user hostile design. Um, that definitely depends on how privileged the person is who is not fighting back as hard because, well, if you can easily switch jobs if you're not dependent on the job or if the company is dependent on you, you can obviously push back harder um, than if you if you allow a great employee or if you're in a place where getting a new job is more difficult. So a bit of a call to action. What can you do? First of all, if you're a web developer, uh, refuse to implement user hostile design patterns. Um, a union or workers council can help you with that, uh, especially if you're threatened because you refused. Uh, educating others. Many do not know how big this issue is. Many just think it's a bit of an annoyance, but it can be really difficult for some people. Also, just being attentive, looking at everything critically and maybe if you're seeing hostile design patterns somewhere where you wouldn't have expected them, talk to the people behind those sites or designs because maybe they're not even, they don't even know what they're doing right now because they just copied what everyone else was doing. So maybe they might change it. You could also talk to politicians. If you're really happy, they might even listen. Uh, if you're really lucky, they might even listen. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening. I was way too quick. I'm sorry for that. Uh, join a union if you haven't already. I usually put on an email address, but I always forgot to reply to those. So like uh, I'm on 
Fediverse, Mastodon, you could message me there. Uh, I'm more likely to reply there. But there's also a contact email on my blog, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, despite being quick, um, it was very informative and it leaves us enough time to get all your questions uh, you might have so we can discuss them. If you have any questions, raise your hand. I will come to you with a microphone and you can talk into it clearly and loudly. Please keep it concise. I try. Hey, um, I want to know, do you have any um, advice on how we can improve skipping those um, cookies or something. Is there some plugin for certain browsers or so that I don't waste my time uh, trying to figure out which button to press? Um, so uh, if you've got an ad blocker, you can usually install added lists to that. And you could uh, install a list which is called prebake, which will remove most of these. Uh, things, but many sites will uh, consider removing them as a form of consent, which it obviously isn't. So you should probably get uh, a list which uh, removes the consent banners and then an add-on which uh, removes the trackers in addition to that. I will have a talk at four about that, so attend the talk and learn about how to get rid of this because uh, it's my research actually to do this thing. Oh, that's very great. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? What would you like to know about these patterns? No more questions? Ah, there. Hey. <laughs> Is it legal that um, news are hidden behind banners like that, that you can only see them with um, if you consent to cookies or you pay for something? Um, I'm not sure, because in my interpretation of what I've read, it's not. But so many sites do this, and like very bit, big ones at that. Uh, they've got uh, tons of lawyers who probably uh, check that and um, maybe it's legal, but it definitely should not be. Thank you. I would be then curious if you are developing websites that don't, you claim that they don't need the consent, so are you not collecting any aggregated statistics like uh, about what uh, sites are being open, what pages are being loaded by the users, because already these basically require consent by the e-privacy directive. I don't get any statistics on my pages. So, <laughs> well, what I do at work, we've got uh, uh, something that uh, does some stat collecting, but uh, that one is. Uh, like they've got lawyers that uh, checked it and we also don't track cross site or anything. But on my personal sites, you will not be tracked at all. I don't even know how many people read my blog posts. Probably no one, but <laughs> yeah. I'm facing the same, yeah. <laughs> um, off the top of your head, uh, do you, can you think of an instance where you found a really user-friendly feature, like an anti-dark pattern, basically? <laughs> well, one thing um, that I think is at least somewhat positive is uh, when I signed up for a free trial for some, some app, I got multiple emails uh, that this free trial would be continued if I did not cancel it. So I actually knew about it and I was reminded that I sh should, have to, should cancel it. Um, that one was not necessary on their part, but it was nice. Any more questions from the audience? <laughs> like you have a bonus card or something. <laughs> Maybe what would you wish 
from the legislators because I would actually stand for uh, the opinion that European legislation compared to the rest of the world is ahead. And even that GDPR led to a lot of these annoying pop-ups, still if you compare the dark patterns from US and from Europe, uh, numerous studies showed up how significantly better it is in Europe. So what would you maybe wish from the legislators to uh, do better? Because I think they also need input actually from us, from developers. Um, yes, absolutely. We're pretty lucky here that we've actually got some legislation that they tried and um, what I want them to do is to listen to the voices from developers, from users and um, implement that because like uh, often in the legislative process um, they don't really listen to the experts that much. And also I think, uh, I, I obviously don't want to make any allegations but probably listen a bit less to lobbyists who tell you that all this is not as much of a, an issue as it actually is. So we maybe have time for another few questions if you have any. And raise your hand if you want to uh, fit your question in before the next talk. are they getting while they're tracking you and how bad is it that they're getting that information? Um, so that obviously depends. Uh, one of the things is that they track you across uh, different sites so they basically have your entire browsing, browsing history and they can use that for advertising but also um, Like, you might not think it's uh, as bad, but they actually uh, create these profiles of people, um, uh, which are like groups of people which have like funny names, uh, which uh, combine a lot of people who might, might be a leftist or might be um, having a walking impairment or something. And then people can buy these lists of people in, in that category and they can use it for targeted um, advertisement and in general I don't I simply don't believe that this data should be collected at all about who you are unless you personally write it into the net. Also some sites want uh, your accurate geolocation that's pretty common and I don't think any website unless I'm ordering food or something uh, should know my accurate geolocation. Last question, real quick. If not, um, it's time to give another big round of applause to this Forex Unicorn. Thank you so much for your talk.